Hi everybody, this is Dan. It's um, September 22nd, my time, 23rd, your time. This is session two of the Letters from Jesus, uh, Book of Revelation. And um, we're going to jump right in, okay? <clears throat> you know, I was uh, we talked last week about, it, there. it's a two-sided coin. On one hand, uh, Matthew 24, 36 says, No one knows the day or the hour, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So, on one hand, we're told, mm, don't do your charts and graphs and predict dates and all that, because what are those words? No one knows. Not even Jesus, apparently, but this is a revelation that the Father is giving to the Son, and Jesus is dictating this letter that John's writing down. And so on one side, we have this, you know, don't freak out over this, and yet on the other side, we get this, uh, be like the sons of Ishakar that understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So on one hand, we're not going to circle uh, a a date on the calendar and say this is the time and yet we want to be aware of um, what I would call the time of the signs we want to make sure that we understand you know we're in the ballpark right but I couldn't help but when I was uh, studying for this I came across um, a promo for a new book that's out now I have to read it to you it's in the PowerPoint that I'm sending you on it says i guess the book's called the next prophecies and here's the tag uh, the next prophecy book prepares the reader for powerful future world events don't get left behind to face the next prophecies order the book now the next prophecy and get a free <laughs> apocalypse road book apocalypse road is a novel that follows a family through their experiences of the next prophecies sign up now uh it just seems like it's a, a contradiction to the whole no one knows scenario but i'll let that one go i just as i read that i thought of uh, you guys i thought about this study and uh, once again we'll try to stay in the middle and uh, not set dates by any means, but on the other hand, um, be watchers on the wall. Be ready for what's truly coming down the pike. So, we covered the first part, and we're now going to jump into, we're going to take a church a week. This week, we're going to take uh, the church at Ephesus. Uh, I, I have a map for you to see of the seven churches of Revelation. And if you can pull that up and look at it, you'll see that um, there's an order to all of this. You have Ephesus, number one, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And on the map, you also see where John was at, at Patmos. You know, when I was doing my research, I found that this was actually the postal route that the Romans would use to deliver mail. And so it kind of goes in order. It makes sense. And I thought I'd just give you this uh, snapshot for you to take a look at. So let's talk a little bit about that first stop. You can see the picture here, uh, Ephesus. Um, first of all, no big time city. In the library at Ephesus, there were over 12,000 books or scrolls. And remember, all of this now is hand written. It was the center of worship for the goddess Diana. Of course, we have the events in Acts where the, the city is in an uproar and the silversmiths are rioting because of Paul. Uh, it was here in Ephesus that we had the first world bank. So, you know, sometimes we sit back and we think, oh, they don't have the same temptations and problems that we have today. Listen, the three major things that the devil pounds away on time and time again is what? Money, sex, and power. Ephesus, the center of money. The first world bank 
was here in Ephesus. Um, sex, uh, the, temp the temple of Diana, um, prostitutes everywhere. It's the way you worshiped. Uh, power, the intellectuals of that day, the library. It was, it was, Ephesus was called the light of Asia. And so in the midst of this big time city, we have a church, we have a movement, we have Ephesus. And so we read to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. A couple things here. I've already mentioned Ephesus. The name literally means darling. Um, it, it was the light of Asia. And then let's notice that Jesus is going to talk about a couple things here. Three to be exempt. Uh, we've got the seven stars. So we talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, I think this is referring to um, the leadership the eldership, not, not maybe just it, because at this time that John's writing, you, you had a, a leadership in place, although they had stellar leadership at Ephesus. We know that Paul stayed in Ephesus longer than any other place that he visited on his missionary journeys. We know that Timothy was here. We know that um, Apollos, we know that uh, Aquila, and um, um, the Apostle John himself, obviously, being in this place. So a stellar leadership. Jesus is saying, uh, um, I hold the leadership in my hand. And then notice he says, I'm in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And, and some of your translation may say candlesticks. Now, the candles burn out. Lampstands burn oil. And we know that the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so there's an intimacy factor here. Jesus is saying, uh, I, he, later on, he's going to say, I know, I know you. I know what's going on. So I want you to understand that Jesus has anointed and he says, I'll take care of the leadership. And by the way, I'm in the midst of where you're at and what's going on. And so, again, in these letters, we're going to find intimacy, his involvement. He's going to praise them for some things. And then he's going to say, nevertheless, here's some issues that we have to deal with. And then he's going to give them some promises. So, first up, Ephesus. Verse 2, I know. And we should probably stop there and let that sink in. Uh, I know this, this word in the Greek is, I have full knowledge. It's not, I have a hunch, or I heard about this, or whatever. No, I, I know. I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and you found them liars. He commands them, or commends them, I should say, for their diligence. Remember, 30 years ago, Paul warned the Ephesian elders that false teachers would come in from the outside and even arise from within the church. This is Acts 20 verses 29 and 30 for I know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves you know the danger of the church is not so much the demonic forces on the outside. Remember, Jesus made it clear at Caesarea Philippi when he pointed to the gates of hell, at least that's what they knew that place to be, 
or the traditions of the ages. And he basically made the statement saying, no force on the outside will be able to destroy the church. The gates of hell will not stand against it. We have to understand, however, that the church needs to be on the offensive, not the defensive. We are not to huddle in a building somewhere and, quote, bring people to the building. Thus, they're bringing, we're bringing people to church. No, we need to be an invasion force. But the truth is that the outside cannot conquer us. Can we be conquered? Can we be compromised? Yes. Paul says to the Galatians, he says, watch out lest you bite and devour yourselves. Our biggest danger is from the inside. And that's what Paul is saying here. I should say, John, you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. False leaders. Winds of heresy, of doctrine. They pop up from time to time. The problem is, is that we're human, we're going to suffer, we're going to, we're going to sin, we're going to fall, and we're prone to the flesh. So we have to be on our guard, and he's saying to them, you've done well. This is commending them. But concerning the end times, Jesus is going to continue to hammer away on but you need to watch, you need to be alert, you need to pray, and here are those words, don't be deceived. And again, that deception comes from where? The inside out. How do we keep from being deceived? We need to make sure that whatever wind of doctrine, whatever teaching it may be that pops up is validated in the scriptures. The scriptures are our roadmap, our protection, our safety. And so, again, we need to, when we're hearing things, if there's heresy, we need to say those words, what does the Bible say about this? And check the source. And again, a body is healthy, but you know, I've been told by doctors that in got a bunch of doctors in the congregation here today. I've been told that, you know, we all have strep, we all have a form of cancer, but it's our immune system. That when our immune system is at work, we're healthy. It's once our immune system is down that these cancerous or strep or whatever it is, take over and go out of control. We need to make sure in the body, in the church, our immune system's in place. And once again, that immune system to fight off disease is the word of God. What does the Bible say? But we're still just on verse two, and this is him commending them. So not only have they been on the alert They've kept from being deceived. They've recognized false prophets, teachers, apostles, etc. Now verse saying, he says, And you have persevered and have patience. You've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Three things. This is a busy church. This is a big city church. There were temptations. They were persecuted. They've hung in there. They've been a light. Ephesus wasn't a light to the world. The church was a light. They've, and here's one of those words. They labor, they're busy. And by the way, God wants laborers. He doesn't want pew potatoes. He doesn't want people that just have it up here in elect. He wants people that their hearts are won by him and their actions are known by him. Remember, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, go make disciples, not converts, disciples, teaching them to walk in my ways, be obedient to my teachings, not just know them. So they've labored, they've worked hard, they've persevered. This is the Greek word, bastezo. 
Uh, it means to take up in order to carry or bear, to put upon oneself something to be carried or to bear what is burdensome. They've hung in there. They've persevered. They've had patience. The Greek word, haponi. The characteristics of a man who's not swerved from his deliberate purpose, his loyalty to the faith and piety by even the greatest of trials and sufferings. So they have perseverance, they have patience, they've labored. Now, if only the letter could have ended here. But, nevertheless, that's the word, verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and repeat the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Nevertheless. Now it's important here in the overall scheme of things to realize that they left their first love. It wasn't lost. They left it. And because they've left love, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell where there's no love. But it's a first love. This is, uh, some, some would say it's an infatuation, a, 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 a puppy love sort of thing. Um, you remember the difference between uh, David and Solomon. David the knowledge of God, the relationship with God, the walking with God, the worship, David's heart. Solomon, knowledge, wisest man. God wants devotion, not just doctrine. These people, once again, were too busy. They labored. They were busy on the business of the king. And they started to not have time just being with the king. The three R's. Remember. Repent. And repeat your first works. That word remember is very important through the scriptures. How often do we have, even in the Torah, with Moses saying, don't forget the Lord your God. Don't forget the things that he's done. Don't forget his promises. Remember, remember, remember. And so if they've lost this sort of uh, first love, which we'll talk about here again it, they could say, no, our love is now a more of a mature love. But Jesus is making it clear that if they don't remember, if they don't repent, and if they don't do the first things, the seriousness of that is that he'll remove the lampstand. It's emphatic. Stop. Turn around. Return. And return to what? And, and again, just a reminder, as I've said before, we need to return to what? We need to return to the elements that create the fire of the church today, the light that comes forth, and that's the Word of God, being devoted to the Word of God, being devoted to prayer, being devoted to the breaking of bread and the fellowship. That's what we need to go back to. We're not, we, we don't graduate and no longer need one another. Remember, without love, visible love, the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell. And so let's just remember a little bit of that first love. Do you remember 
when you first were saved? I do. I, I can remember it very clearly. Um, praying all the time, reading my Bible, underlining it, getting my concordance out, listening to tapes. I couldn't get enough. It, it was an infatuation love. I didn't know much, but I'll tell you what, I was, I, I had boldness to speak about the love of Jesus. I remember the night I got saved, I woke my parents up and I said to them, guess what? I'm a Christian. And I remember my dad saying, oh my God, I hope you're not a Jehovah's Witness. And I said, oh no, I don't know really what I am, but I, Jesus has come into my heart. I mean, there was that first love, that infatuation. And, and, and I guess for us that are married, I think it's easy to compare it to our relationship with our brides. Oh man, can I tell you when I was smitten by my wife, um, we lived in different households, it's a different story, but I worked the graveyard shift at a, um, Roar Industries, it was an aircraft parts factory, and my wife worked um, in welfare, and the way it worked out is that when I got off work, she was driving home, and I knew which off-ramp of the road she had to get off on. She drove a little blue Mazda. And I'll tell you, sometimes I waited 10, 15 minutes just to see that little blue Mazda go by and to wave. Oh, it made my night or day. You know, it's that, oh, espousal love, engagement. It's like going steady. It's wearing the class ring. You were so in love with one another, you couldn't see straight or think straight. Now, again, I don't wait by the freeway today when to see, wait 10, 15 minutes just to see my wife's car. I love her with all my heart, but some would say that infatuation has waned. It's kind of weird when you think about it, that weirdness of love. But I think that Jesus enjoys that weirdness. I think that Jesus was saying, you know what? What you once had, you need to get back. Because if you're not emotionally involved in love with me, and it's simply transferring to your mind, guess what? It's going to be dry. It's going to be old. It's going to be rote. There'll be no life in it whatsoever. And if it gets to that point, I've got to come and I've got to remove your lampstand. Ouch. You've done all of this well. Your report card is A, 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 C minus D plus F. You're losing your first love. Well, let's figure out our GPA. If we figure it out our GPA, well, we got 12, 13, 14 divided by five. Well, you know, we're at a B minus, uh, four A's and a D or whatever. C, B, B, solid B. No, for Jesus, that report card is a failure. And I'm going to remove your lampstand if you don't get that first love back. And I think in all of our lives, like I said, when we read these seven letters to the churches, there's going to be something in each one of these churches that is going to speak to us. So tonight, when you discuss this lesson, remember those words that we need to remember. We need to repent and we need to repeat and do the first works. Well, we'll wrap this up. The last two verses, uh, again, Jesus is going to say, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, let's, let's stop there before we finish this off. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nico, 
uh, Nike, Victory, Laity, Laetans, Victory, Control over the Laity. Jesus, by the way, doesn't say very often in the scriptures, he doesn't name specific things that he hates. Here he does. I, it's not dislike, it's emphatic. I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What were they? You know, there are some talk about some um, early church father named Nicholas or whatever, but I think we just take the word and we understand that when Jesus died, remember the veil was torn from top to bottom. In other words, everybody can come in. Everybody has full access to God. You don't need a priest. You don't need somebody to go for you or make a way for you. You have total free access. We don't need veil menders to sew it back up again. That was the Nicolaitans. The ones that would come and say, we have special insight and knowledge. We are the clergy. You are the laity. You need us to take you in to the presence of God. We will read the Bible and explain it to you. You don't have that ability. Do you, you see where I'm going with this? And notice what Jesus says. This fake company of the elite, the Nicolaitans or whatever, Jesus says what? I hate that. I hate it. And again, commendation to them, but this you have that you too hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then we end with the Shema, with a hear, he who has a ear, let him hear, Shema, what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Um, you got an ear? Make sure that you hear. As we make our way through this, may our prayers in the beginning and the end be that we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, not just to our church, but to me. What is God saying to me? He's going to pat you on the back. Accept that. There are things that are commendable. We need that encouragement. But also, there may be times where he says, turn around and we get a kick in the rump hears nevertheless you have got to either get rid of this or return to this or whatever the case may be let us be open to that correction and so to him who has ears to hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes overcomers the metacoy those that share in companionship, in being a comrade, a partner. It's the company of the committed. To those that overcome, I'll give the tree of life. Amen. I, I will, next week, I'll keep you on hold till next week because I think I have some inside information, sounds like the Nicolaitans, right? About the tree of life. So next week, let's talk about the tree of life. Discussion questions for today. Um, what were the Ephesians commended for? And what would Jesus say to the church of Cal in terms of what are you doing well? And what does it mean to you personally uh, to lose your first love? And how can you rekindle that love for Jesus? 
And then lastly, what dangers do the Nicolaitans present to today's church? Well, uh, God bless you once again. I know many of you are very well aware of our situation. I just got back yesterday and uh, I knew that I wouldn't be able to be live with you tonight. So I'm going to put this up right away, send it off to you. Um, Thank you for your prayers. I don't know what else to say. Um, they're felt prayers. And there was a time that I didn't think I'd make it back, but um, things actually worked out well, but we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, Sharon and I are going to probably stagger our times back and forth, but please, uh, as I know you're already doing, please keep us in your prayers. God bless you. Shalom.